Comedy legend Richard Pryor influenced a whole new generation of comedians. Although the road was rocky, he blazed the trail. You name me a comedian had to, through some way, have been influenced by Richard Pryor because we call him the king. We call him the greatest. From Robin Williams to Robin Harris, J. Anthony Brown, Bruce Bruce, Louis C.K., George Carlin, Don Rickles, I know Jerry Seinfeld. You name me a comedian, Carrot Top, everybody was influenced by Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor was born on December 1, 1940, in Peoria, Illinois. His father, Leroy, was a former Golden Gloves boxer and a pimp. His mother, Gertrude, was a bookkeeper and a prostitute. He was basically born in a brothel owned by his grandmother. Both of his parents suffered from drug addiction and alcoholism, and at the age of 10, he was abandoned by his parents and raised by his grandmother. It was a very tough childhood. Richard first had an interest in becoming an actor inspired by his grandmother's old records. A bunch of records upstairs, old Darce Day records. And I go upstairs and yeah, listen to those. And imagine I was in a play and imagine I was in Hollywood. He had a love for Western films at a young age. And as Richard began to grow up, he used comedy as a coping mechanism. At one point, the only way he felt he could escape the ghetto was to join the military, which he did. Unfortunately, he spent most of his tour of duty in a military prison for allegedly slashing someone with a switchblade. Upon his discharge from the army, Pryor got his first cabaret gig at an African-American nightclub in Peoria, where he sang and played the piano. Richard was from an era when you might have to do anything. Maybe one night he needed to sing, maybe another night he needed to tell jokes. So he had to have skills in all those things. Richard soon realized that the audience preferred his jokes to his singing. He started working in all black comedy clubs in Peoria. And in 1963, he left the Midwest for New York City. He studied the craft in the clubs alongside comics such as George Carlin. Richard made his first TV appearance on August 31st, 1964. On Broadway tonight, for the first time on television, Richard Pryor. But this wasn't the Richard Pryor we all grew to love this era I like to call the pre-mustache era. This act consisted of prop comedy, he didn't swear, he wore a suit, and was very politically correct. Richard started out as an imitation of Bill Cosby. At the time, Bill Cosby was one of the only black comics on TV, and Richard thought he needed to be like Bill to be accepted into the mainstream. By using this style of comedy, Richard began gaining some attention and became a rising star, appearing regularly on the Merv Griffin Show. Here he is, our own little Richie Pryor. Richard. Due to a lot of racial tensions, black comics were not featured on TV very often. So Richard was blazing a trail and gaining momentum. How do you do that, Richie? You just, uh... I don't know. I just gotta go out there and I'll just do it. I, I don't know. <laughs> but this was not the real Richard Pryor. This was a character that Richard had developed over time. And eventually, he began to get restless. Times were changing in New York, and racial tensions were at an all time high. In September of 1967, Pryor was performing at the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas when he had an epiphany on stage. He looked out among the crowd and he saw lots of white people all dressed in suits and ties. He then realized he was probably one of the only black people even allowed in the club. At that very moment, Richard Pryor felt like a circus sideshow. He felt so embarrassed that he walked off the stage in the middle of his set. 
He'd rather walk away from a successful career than be a phony any longer. And that night, the Richard Pryor character died. After walking off stage in Las Vegas, Richard was pretty much blacklisted from Vegas clubs. He was broke and frustrated, so he made his way to Berkeley, California. At the time, Berkeley was the center of a lot of social change. You had the Vietnam protests, free speech, and the rise of the Black Panther Party. Richard had a bit of a spiritual awakening while he was in Berkeley. He was inspired by people like Malcolm X and wanted to be a voice for social and racial inequality. And that's when the mustache era began, and Richard found his voice. He made the decision he was going to do something different, or quit comedy altogether. He tackled a lot of taboo subjects like race, sex, and poverty, all the things he was afraid to address on TV. By the time Richard left Berkeley, he had reinvented himself and was better than ever. This act consisted of black and white comparisons, which no one was doing at the time. He also did a lot of painfully honest character studies. Even though he offended lots of people, his popularity kept growing. He released five Grammy-winning comedy records, and they became hugely popular, not only among African Americans, but to the white population as well. Uh, uh, the title of the album is That Nigga's Crazy. <laughs> and then, don't that nigga look crazy? <laughs> I, one crazy nigga. But don't you get... <laughs> See, now you can just say that and talk... Yeah, well, look, I said, used to be... I'd punch you out. <laughs> he was one of the first African-American comics to do white people impressions. Yeah, come on, peckerhead. Richard finally achieved his childhood dream by becoming an actor on the big screen. He was cast in Lady Sings the Blues alongside Diana Ross and Billy Dee Williams. Richard stole the show and received a lot of recognition. He was a natural from the start and you could attribute the fact that he'd been acting like Bill Cosby for years. Richard's popularity exploded, and he appeared in Uptown Saturday Night, The Bingo Long Traveling All-Stars, and Silver Streak. He played three characters in Which Way Is Up. As I was developing the film with Richard, um, I realized that he could play not only the lead character, but he could play two other characters his uh, father and a bootleg preacher. Definitely the first black film that, that had multiple characters played by one actor. And Richard just loved, loved that whole experience and was hysterically funny. The hardest job I had was trying to keep the crew from laughing. Richard also wrote for the Flip Wilson show in Sanford and Son. In 1973, he won an Emmy for his writing on the television special Lily, featuring Lily Tomlin. Richard was cast as a guest host for the first episode of Saturday Night Live. Executives at NBC really didn't want Richard to perform live on national TV because of his controversial act. Lauren Michaels pushed hard for Richard to host the show, but executives needed a contingency plan. So they came up with a five to seven second delay just in case he went off the rails. In 1977, Richard suffered a heart attack. All those years of drug use finally caught up with him. In 1980, Pryor was freebasing cocaine. And well, he basically blew himself up comedian and writer, was badly burned in an accident at his home in California last night. The burns cover the upper half of his body. They are severe enough to endanger his life. I was there when Richard burned, but I didn't know it was Richard. And when he ran past me and ran out of the house, and then I realized that was Richard. 
And I was, frankly, afraid when I do free bass with Richard because the torch was so big. And so it was inevitable that one day, if you got the torch and it's shh, you may turn it the wrong way, all right? And other people had similar accidents, but when he did it, it resulted in a fire. How many people you ever heard of freebasing? Have you ever heard of anybody blowing up? <laughs> Why me? He spent six weeks in the hospital recovering. In 1982, Richard made an epic comeback with Live on the Sunset Strip. This is the second time Richard had to reinvent himself. Richard based his new act on his struggle with drug addiction. He also had a bit of a spiritual awakening when he traveled to Africa and stopped using racial terms. It made me say, oh my God, I've been wrong. I've been wrong. I got to regroup my I mean, I said, I ain't gonna never call another black man nigga. Pryor decided to focus more on his movie career in the 1980s with films The Toy, Brewster's Millions, and Superman 3, where he earned a reported $4 million, more than co-star Christopher Reeve. He was the highest paid African-American actor, but his heart really wasn't in it like before. This time it was simply for the money. In 1986, Pryor appeared on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. He looked very thin and frail, and rumors started to swirl that Pryor was infected with AIDS. He was forced to reveal that he was diagnosed with MS. Pryor didn't let it slow him down, though. He still performed and got calls for movies like Critical Condition, See No Evil, Hear No Evil, and Harlem Nights. By 1990, Richard was extremely sick and suffers a second heart attack. He eventually is confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. He refused to stop doing stand-up comedy, though. They'd roll him up on stage and he'd tell jokes about being in a wheelchair and his struggles with MS. Eventually, he was confined to his house as his body slowly started to slip away. And on December 10th, 2005, Pryor suffered his final heart attack and passed away at the age of 65. He's still influencing generations to come. His jokes transcended race and his audience was diverse. He will forever be a legend in comedy. <laughs>